Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the Wnt beta catenin pathway, which is also known as the canonical Wnt pathway. Okay, so we've now discussed the off state of the Wnt beta catenin pathway, which is basically where there's no Wnt in the extracellular fluid, there is therefore no activation of the frizzled uh, LRP5 slash 6 receptors, uh, and uh, therefore the beta catenin destruction complex is functional and uh, it binds beta catenin molecules phosphorylates them at four separate sites, and then uh, releases those beta-catenin molecules, which then get bound to by the enzyme beta-TRCP, which then ubiquitinates the beta-catenin protein, uh, which is then destroyed by the proteasome. So it's a short life for beta-catenin when the Wnt beta-catenin pathway is in the off state. So now let's discuss the Wnt beta-catenin pathway in the on state, which is where there is Wnt in the extracellular fluid, okay, and it is going to be activating uh, frizzled and LRP5-6 receptors. Okay, so let's now discuss this on state then. So, uh, once again, let's, in fact, actually, let's go back to our other picture, wherever it's gone. Okay, this picture here, remember, here is our uh, frizzled receptor with our LRP uh, receptor with the Wnt bound between them, okay? And uh, let's now talk about how um, this is going to inactivate the beta-catenin destruction complex. So, coming back to this story then now, um, the frizzled receptor, once it has the Wnt bound to it like this, is going to bind now to a protein called disheveled. Okay, so I'll draw this here. So a protein is going to come and bind to the frizzled receptor once it has Wnt bound to it. And this protein is within a family of proteins known as disheveled proteins. So there is not just one disheveled protein, there are many disheveled proteins, okay? Um, but they all effectively do the same thing, so we'll just abbreviate them all down to being represented by this green rectangle called disheveled. Okay, now, uh, disheveled proteins are usually abbreviated to DSH proteins for short, or you can also see disheveled proteins abbreviated to DVL proteins, uh, whichever one you want to use. We're, I'll probably switch between them. In fact, I'll probably stick to DSH. I prefer DSH to DVL. Okay, right. So a disheveled protein comes and binds to the intracellular aspect of our frizzled receptor here once the frizzled receptor has Wnt bound to it. Okay, now, what does the disheveled protein now do? Well, basically, it is going to break down the beta-catenin destruction complexes. Okay, so remember what the beta-catenin destruction complex is consisted of. Okay, so in the off state of the Wnt beta-catenin pathway, a beta-catenin destruction complex consisted of an axin protein here, okay, with an adenomatous polyposis coli protein here, okay, then we have the glycogen synthase kinase free beta enzyme here, and then we have our casein kinase 1 alpha here. So let's just label these up. So here's CK1 alpha, here is glycogen synthase kinase free beta. So let's color all of these in. So we'll have glycogen synthase kinase free beta in, in green here. Okay, we'll have casein kinase 1 alpha in blue here. We'll have axin in red here. Okay, and then we'll have adenomatous polyposis coli in orange here. Okay, so this is our wind. Uh, our, sorry, our beta-catenin destruction complex in the off state. Now, what's going to happen is once you've got uh, this disheveled protein here now, it's going to uh, bind to certain portions of this beta-catenin destruction complex and separate them off from being able to participate in a, a beta-catenin destruction complex like this. So it's going to break the beta-catenin destruction complexes apart, basically. So, Disheveled binds to axin, okay? Now, 
the axin which is going to bind to disheveled can bring with it casein kinase 1 alpha, which I'll draw here and also glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, but it's not going to bring along with it the adenomatous polyposis coli. Okay, so let's color these once in the, again in. Okay, so here's our glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta in green here. Here is our casein kinase 1 alpha in blue here, and then we've got our axin protein here in red. Okay, and the axin has bound to the disheveled, and then the axin has bound to it the casein kinase 1 alpha and the glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, but no longer does it have adenomatous polyposis coli bound to it. Okay, now what then is going to happen is this is going to bring our glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta very close to the NRP5 uh, slash 6 receptor here. Okay, and then the glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta is actually going to phosphorylate residues within the LRP5 slash 6. So LRP5 slash 6, the cytoplasmic tail of this is going to become phosphorylated. Now, before I discuss what the purpose of that is, let's just take a step back and talk about the fact that we have now isolated three components of the beta-catenin destruction complex. Okay, that means that the number of beta-catenin destruction complexes are now going to start going down because we're going to have these receptors becoming activated all over the cell. Okay, and they're all going to be sequestering components of the beta-catenin destruction complex and therefore the number of functional beta-catenin destruction complexes is going to go down. Now, uh, that's just from these binding to the disheveled. The phosphorylation of the LRP5-6 is going to act as a positive feedback, basically, because now, once you have phosphorylated the cytoplasmic tail of LRP5-6, what can happen is this phosphorylated tail of LRP5-6 can actually also bind to axin molecules which have glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta attached to them, but this time not casein kinase 1 alpha. Okay, so what's going to happen now is, ooh, and I've colored it in the exact wrong color, never mind. Um, this should be in green, I do apologize for that. There we go, overridden. Okay, so here is our axin bound to our glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. Okay, so this is axin here. This is GSK 3 beta. Okay, so these two components can now bind to the phosphorylated cytoplasmic tail of the LRP5-6. So basically, this is further sequestering components of the beta-catenin destruction complex. So overall, what is happening when you activate the frizzled receptor in the LRP5-6 uh, receptors and dimerize them together like this, is you are assembling um, these protein complexes which just sequester loads of the components of the beta-catenin destruction complexes so that the number of beta-catenin destruction complexes uh, in the cytoplasm is just going to go down and down and down. Now then, what is the result of reducing the number of beta-catenin destruction complexes uh, within the cell? Well, you're no longer going to be phosphorylating beta-catenin as rapidly, okay? So beta-catenin molecules are not going to be phosphorylated, which means that they're not going to end up being bound to uh, by the beta-TRCP protein, okay? Which means that they're not then going to be ubiquitinated and they're not going to be destroyed. Destroyed. So the effect of removing the, well, reducing the number of beta-catenin destruction complexes is that the amount of beta-catenin within the cytoplasm goes up. Okay, so beta-catenin levels within the cytoplasm is now going to go up, basically. Okay, right. So we now want to study what is the effect of beta-catenin proteins going up. Well, basically. When the beta-catenin builds up within the cytoplasm, what's going to happen is the beta-catenin proteins are going to start going into the nucleus. 
Okay, so all of what we've been discussing so far has been occurring in the cytoplasm. Okay, but now, once the beta catenin builds up here, it's going to start going into the nucleus. Okay, and there it's going to act as a transcriptional activator. Okay, right. Now, before we actually discuss what the beta catenin is going to do within the nucleus, it's best to go back and discuss the off state again. So, remember, uh, before we discussed the on state within the cytoplasm, it was best first to discuss the off state. Again, it's now best to go back to the off state and discuss what was happening in the nucleus when the wind beta catenin pathway was in the off state, before we then look at what happens in the nucleus when the wind beta catenin pathway is in the on state. Okay, so let's firstly start with what is happening in the off state. Okay, so in the off state, you have very little beta catenin. Okay, so we now need to discuss uh, something known as the TCF LEF family of transcription factors. Okay, so we need to discuss TCF LEF family of transcription factors. Okay, so before we actually discuss this specific family of transcription factors, I firstly want to discuss broadly what a transcription factor actually is firstly, and then we'll look at this specific family, which is the T-cell factors and then lymphoid enhancer binding factors. Okay, uh, so firstly then, what is a transcription factor? So, let me draw these two parallel lines here. And now these two parallel lines this time do not represent the inner leaflet and the outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Instead, this now represents a double-stranded piece of DNA, a DNA duplex, okay? So the two complementary strands of DNA. Now, this portion that I am boxing here, this is going to be a gene within the double-stranded DNA. So I'll outline this in red here. Okay, so this is a gene. Now, one of the strands of the gene will be what's known as the coding strand. So let's say that this strand that I'm highlighting here in purple, this is the coding strand. Okay, and this is the strand that the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme is going to work its way along and synthesize a piece of mRNA that is complementary to it. Okay, so I'll show this here. So this strand here that's now highlighted in blue, this is a piece of mRNA that is complementary to that coding strand, which can then go off and be translated into a sequence of amino acids, okay, into a polypeptide. Now, upstream of all genes in the eukaryotic genome, you have a region known as the promoter region, okay? So I'll call this portion here the promoter region. Now, the promoter region is not involved directly in actually being translated into a sequence of amino acids. So it's not actually going to be a part that codes for a portion of protein. However, it's important in controlling the expression level of the downstream gene. I, it's important in controlling how much the protein associated with this gene you're actually going to produce. Okay, now how does it exert that control, that epigenetic control, basically. Well, um, it exerts that control by controlling how often you're going to actually transcribe the genes. So the fancy word for transferring the uh, sequence of organic bases on the coding strand into a sequence of organic bases within mRNA is that we are transcribing the um, genetic code, okay? And this process is known as transcription. Okay, so the promoter region is going to control the rate at which we transcribe uh, the coding strands, so how much transcription is actually going to occur. Now, how does it control this? Well, basically, it is the promoter region where the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme is going to bind to the DNA. Okay, now for short, RNA polymerase 2 is often abbreviated to RNAP2, like so, RNA 
P for polymerase and N2. So RNA polymerase 2 binds to the promoter region and then will work its way along the promoter region to um, produce this piece of mRNA. That mRNA will then uh, go and um, be translated into protein. So, if the promoter region is very good at getting RNA polymerases to bind to it and work its way then along the uh, coding strand of the DNA and synthesize a piece of mRNA, then you'll get loads of mRNA being produced. You'll get, therefore, loads of protein being produced for this gene. Whereas if this promoter region is not very good at getting the RNA polymerase to bind here, then you'll get RNA polymerase to working along its way along the coding strand very rarely, and you'll get very little mRNA being produced, and therefore very little protein being produced. Okay, so that is how the promoter region controls the expression of the downstream gene, okay, by controlling uh, how likely the RNA polymerase 2 is actually uh, to bind to the promoter region and work its way along the coding strand of the downstream gene. Now then, the concept of a transcription factor then. Okay, a transcription factor is a molecule uh, which is capable of binding to uh, the DNA within the promoter region, and it will bind to a specific sequence of organic bases within the promoter region. Okay, and what the transcription factor will do is it will change how good the promoter region is at binding to the RNA polymerase two. Okay, so transcription factors generally bind to a huge number of different promoter regions. Okay, generally they have sequences of around 6 to 10 organic bases which they recognize and bind to and the promoter regions of many different genes will have these sequences of 6 to 10 organic bases in so this same transcription factor will bind to the promoter region of a plethora of different genes okay and when it binds to those promoter regions, as I say, it changes the likelihood that that promoter region is going to bind to RNA polymerase 2, and therefore uh, the likelihood that the downstream gene is actually going to be transcribed. Now, there are loads of different mechanisms by which transcription factors binding to the promoter regions can alter the likelihood that the gene is to be transcribed, and we'll discuss examples of mechanisms by which they achieve this uh, later on. Okay, but that's the general principle, that they change the likelihood that the downstream gene is going to be transcribed. Now, they don't always necessarily increase the probability that it's going to be transcribed. Sometimes transcription factors will decrease the probability that the downstream gene is actually going to be transcribed. So you have enhancer transcription factors. Uh, which are going to enhance the expression of the downstream gene by increasing the probability that the downstream gene is going to be transcribed. And you also have repressor transcription factors which are going to uh, decrease the probability that the downstream gene is actually going to be transcribed. Okay, right. So, now let's turn our attention specifically to the TCF-LEF family of uh, transcription factors. Okay, so firstly, what does TCF and LEF stand for? Well, TCF stands for T-cell factors. Okay, so the T is for T, and the C is for cell, and then the F is for factor. Okay, and LEF, so that's what TCF stands for. Okay, LEF stands for lymphoid enhancer binding factor. Okay, and I'll just bring this up a little bit. Okay, so the L is therefore for lymphoid, the E is for enhancer. Okay, and then the binding uh, is connected to enhancer by a dash, so therefore doesn't get a letter. And then the F is for factor. Okay, right. So, the TCF-LEF family of transcription factors often is just referred now to the TCF family of transcription factors. So, if you just see this referred to as the TCF family without the LEF family, it's referring to the same family of transcription factors. So, within this family, there are four separate 
genes for transcription factors. Okay, so I'll put these over here. So firstly, there is the T cell factor 1, which is the first member of this family. The second member is then the LEF or lymphoid enhancer binding factor 1. Okay, and that effectively functions as TCF2. Then there is TCF3. Okay, so T cell factor 3, and then finally there is T cell factor 4, TCF4. So those then are the four members of this TCF LEF family of transcription factors. Okay, and as I say, it's often now just referred to as the TCF family of transcription factors, and you just then acknowledge that one of the members of this family is not called TCF, but LEF. Okay. Uh, so, basically, these TCF transcription factors, they are going to bind to a specific sequence of organic bases within DNA. So, many promoter regions have the specific sequence of organic bases which these TCF family transcription factors bind to and recognize. Okay, so let me now give you this sequence of organic bases which you need to have in order for uh, a TCF family transcription factor to bind to you. Okay, so it's um, an eight-membered sequence of organic bases. So it's cytosine, cytosine, then we've got free thymine, so it's thymine, 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 uh, then followed by guanine, and then followed by something which I'm going to put W here. Okay, so what does W stand for? Well, thankfully, it's not some organic base that you've never heard of before. W just means either a T or an A, so it's thymine or adenine. So if we put the complementary sequence here, it's going to be G, G, um, then the complementary organic base to thymine is adenine, um, and the complementary organic base to guanine is cytosine, and then of course the uh, complementary organic base to a thymine or an adenine is going to be uh, another thymine or an adenine, so it's going to be another W, and then uh, another W here. Okay, but obviously these two are going to be the opposite, so if this one's a thymine, this one will be an adenine. If this is an adenine, this one will be a thymine. Okay, right. So this is the sequence of organic bases which you need to have in order for a TCF transcription factor to bind to you. So now a TCF family transcription factor, which remember is the other name for a TCF LEF family transcription factor, is going to bind to this sequence of eight organic bases here. Okay, so I'll colour this thing in purple here. Okay, and this sequence of eight organic bases, like so, this has a special name, and it's found in many different promoter regions for many different genes. Okay, it's known as the Wnt response element, or, or also the Wnt responsive element, whichever you prefer. I'll put Wnt response element. Okay, and for short, the Wnt response element is uh, often abbreviated to the WRE. So you find this in many different promoter regions. So promoter regions are much, much longer than just eight organic bases. But you know, a portion of it could be this sequence of eight organic bases. And we would therefore say that the promoter region contains a Wnt response element uh, and therefore is capable of binding uh, a TCF LEF family transcription factor, so either TCF1, LEF1, TCF3, or TCF4. Okay, right. Now, we are currently uh, in the off state, so we have no beta-catenin present at the moment. In the on state later, when we do have beta-catenin present, beta-catenin is going to bind on top of this TCF-LEF transcription factor. However, we're currently in the off state, and even in the off state, when we have no beta-catenin, the TCF-LEF transcription factor will still be bound to the Wnt response elements in all of the promoter regions that contain Wnt response elements. Okay, now, this is the thing. Now, on top of this, instead of a beta-catenin molecule binding, because we have no beta-catenin molecules by, uh, present at the moment, you are going to get uh, a molecule 
within the family of TLE proteins binding there. Okay, so let's talk about this family of proteins. It has another name as well. It's also known as the Groucho family of proteins. It's known as the Groucho TLE family of proteins. So one of these proteins within this family of proteins is going to bind on top of this TCF-LEF transcription factor. Now firstly, what does TLE stand for? Well, this stands for transducin-like enhancer of split proteins. Okay, so the T is for transducin. Okay, uh, the L is then for like. The E is for enhancer. And then it's the transducin-like enhancer of split proteins. Okay, so that's uh, what TLE stands for. Okay, so this is not just one protein. This is a whole family of proteins which pretty much do the same thing. Okay, so one of these Groucho TLE family proteins is going to bind on top of our TCF-LEF transcription factor even, well, uh, when there is no beta-catenin present. When there's beta-catenin present, beta-catenin is going to bind there instead. Now, um, then, on top of the TLE, what you're then going to get binding is an enzyme known as a histone deacetylase. Okay, so I'll put this here. So here is this enzyme binding to the Groucho slash TLE family protein. Okay, and I'll colour in this enzyme in turquoise here. Okay, so, this enzyme uh, is what's known as a histone deacetylase, and for short, histone deacetylases are abbreviated to HDACs. Okay, so the H is for histone, and then the DAC is for deacetylase. Okay, so the D is for D, and the AC is for acetylase. Okay, so this is an enzyme which is capable of removing acetyl groups from things, specifically from remo uh, removing acetyl groups from histones. Okay, so in order to take this discussion further, we now need to make sure that everyone is on the same grounds with regards to understanding histones. Okay, so let's just have a little discussion of histones then. Okay, so... Um, there are five families of histone proteins, okay? So the five families of histone proteins are the H1 histone proteins, then there is the H2A uh, histone proteins, the H2B histone proteins, the H3 histone proteins, and then also the H4 histone proteins. Now, I want to stress that each of these is a family of proteins. In the human, you will have loads of H1 histones, which will all be slightly different. They'll all have slightly different sequences of amino acids, but they all perform the same function. Okay, so each of these is a family. It contains multiple different proteins that all perform the same function. Okay, so we're not going to discuss the different individual proteins that are within each of these families. We're just going to say, you'll have a histone 2A family member histone here. Okay, we're going to say things like that, basically. Okay, so, what do the histone proteins do? Well, basically, they assemble into structures known as histone core complexes, okay, which are octomers of histone proteins, uh, which DNA molecules are going to wrap around. So firstly, let's discuss the histone core complex on its own, and then we'll discuss the DNA wrapping round uh, the histone core complexes. Okay, so I'm going to draw my octomer of histone proteins here then. Okay, I'll draw it as a cube. Uh, so this is the octomer of histone, so I'll separate it up into eight parts then. Okay, like so. Um, so here are the eight different parts. We've got one, two, three, four, and then we'll have the same underneath. One, two, three, and we can't see the fourth one because it will be right at the back there. Okay, so this is our octomer of histones. Okay, right. Now, um, 
in this octama, you're going to have two histone 2A family histones, two histone 2B family histones, two histone 3 family histones, and two histone 4 family histones. Okay, so let me show you the arrangement here. So we'll start with the histone 4 and the histone 3 histones. Okay, so this one right at the front here, which I'm now colouring in blue here, this is going to be a histone 4 protein. Okay, so it's one of the histone 4 family histones. I don't know specifically which one it is, because remember that's an entire family of proteins, but it's one of them. Okay, it doesn't matter which one it is, they all perform the same function. Okay, uh, here you also have another histone 4 protein. Okay, so two histone 4s are there and there. Then you're going to have a histone 3 protein down here in red. Okay, then you have another histone 3 protein back here, again in red. So both of those are histone 3 proteins. This is a histone 3 protein, and this is also a histone 3 protein. Now, uh, that combination of four histone proteins that we've got there, two histone 3s and two histone 4s, that actually exists in its own right outside of the octama. So when, in fact, you're assembling one of these octamas, you don't just bring eight proteins together and hope that they um, somehow assemble into an octama. Instead, what you do is you do it in stages, obviously. Okay, uh, so one of the things that you'll bring along when you're building one of these octamas is you'll bring something that you've made earlier effectively, which is one of these tetramers of histone threes and histone fours. Okay, so it contains these two histone four histones and these two histone three histones. Okay, so if you imagine these four that I've now coloured in separated from those ones that I haven't coloured in. Uh, that is the tetramer of four histone proteins. So here are the histone threes in red, and then here are um, the histone fours in blue. Okay, right. Uh, so this is what's known as an H3, H4 tetramer. Okay, so it's made up of histone threes and histone fours. Okay, and this is one of the components that you're going to use to make the Octima, okay? Right, so let's now talk about the other four histones, okay? Uh, so, this one right at the front here, this is going to be a histone 2A uh, family histone, so I'll colour that in, in turquoise here. Okay, like so, so that's histone 2A. And then you'll have another histone 2A, but we won't be able to see it. It's the one that we can't see right at the back there. Okay, we can't see a single bit of it. Okay, then the other two that are visible, this one here, which I'm now colouring in light green, and this one down here, which is also in light green, these are histone 2Bs. Okay, so that's a histone 2B right at the back there, and this is a histone 2B at the front here. Okay, right. Now, again, coming to this discussion of how we construct a histone core complex octama here. When we're constructing uh, a histone core complex, we bring in a histone 3, histone 4 tetramer here, and we also bring in two dimers of histone 2A with histone 2B. Okay, so here is histone 2A in turquoise here, and here is histone 2B in green here. Okay, and this dimer of histone 2A with histone 2B is known as a histone 2A, histone 2B dimer. So if you want to construct a full octamer like so, what you do is you bring in a histone 3, histone 4 tetramer. You then bring in two of these histone 2A, histone 2B dimers, and then they can assemble into the full histone core complex, which is an octamer here. Okay, right. Now what you're going to do is you're going to wrap DNA around this histone core complex. Okay, so let me show the DNA molecule here. So this in purple is going to represent the duplex of the DNA strands. So it's a double-stranded piece of DNA. It's going to come around in front of the histone uh, core complex here. It's then going to wrap around the back like so, coming back around to the front here. It's then going to wrap around again, and it's going to come out here, 
OK, right. So it wraps around the histone core complex twice, and then it comes back out. Now, we've discussed all of the histone families except histone 1 uh, family histones. Okay, the histone 1 family histones are not involved in the formation of the histone core complexes. However, histone 1 uh, family proteins bind to the two pieces of DNA that are coming in and then coming out of the histone octomer effectively. Okay, so here, this portion in yellow which probably won't show up in this light, uh, but that portion there, uh, which holds the two uh, incoming and outcoming strands of DNA together, that's where the histone 1 family histone is going to bind. Okay, so uh, this is the function of histones. The DNA within the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell is not just free, okay? It wraps around these histone core complexes. Okay, to create a structure known as chromatin. Okay, so just two more pieces of terminology I want you to be familiar with. Chromatin and also the concept of a nucleosome. Okay, so let me draw your picture of chromatin then. So let's say this is a histone core complex here. And this line here is the DNA coming in. And what's going to happen is the DNA is going to wrap around the histone core complex like so. Then it's going to wrap around again, so it's wrapped around now twice. Then it's going to come out of this histone core complex. And then it's going to go on to another histone core complex down here. Okay, once again it's going to wrap around the histone core complex. There's once. Then it's going to wrap around again twice, and it will go along to the next histone core complex. This is what chromatin is. This strand that you've got, which consists not just of the DNA now, but the protein as well, okay, the histone core complexes. It's often compared to beads on a string, basically. Uh, and the string is the DNA which links the the two um, histone core complexes with DNA wrapped around it uh, that are neighboring to one another together, basically. Okay, and this is known as the linker DNA that's between uh, the two histone core complexes. So that's what chromatin is. It's not just DNA. It's DNA wrapped around histone core complexes. And as I say, the good way of remembering it is beads on a string. Now, the final uh, word that I want you to know before we discuss what a histone deacetylase is going to do is the concept of a nucleosome. Okay, so a nucleosome is the repeating unit of chromatin. So chromatin basically consists of this repetition where you've just got DNA wrapped around the histone core complex followed by a linker piece of DNA then onto another histone core complex. Now it's a common misconception that the nucleosome just refers to the histone core complex with DNA wrapped around. It's close but not quite correct because if we just had histone core complexes with DNA wrapped around that isn't the repeating structure of chromatin we need the linker DNA as well. So, a nucleosome refers to a histone core complex with DNA wrapped around it, along with the linker strand, which takes you to the next histone core complex, which has got DNA wrapped around it. This is the repeating unit of chromatin. We join loads and loads of nucleosomes together to make a piece of chromatin, basically. So that's just some terminology now. Okay, so this is the fundamental idea with regards to histone deacetylases. Do you think it's going to be particularly easy to transcribe DNA which is wrapped around a histone core complex like so. Do you think RNA polymerase is going to have an easy time getting in when you're wrapped tightly around uh, this histone core complex? Well, the answer is no, okay? So, in order to actually get genes which are in the portion of DNA wrapped around this 
histone core complex, which is very likely, okay, because most of the DNA is wrapped around histone core complexes. Very little of the DNA, a small fraction, is actually present in the links between the uh, portions that are wrapped around the histone core complexes. So most of the genes are going to be in sections that are wrapped around histone core complexes. So if you want to actually transcribe those genes, you need to loosen up how um, tightly they are wrapped around the histone core complexes. And a way that you can uh, loosen up how tightly the DNA is wrapped around a histone core complex is by acetylating the uh, histone proteins uh, within the histone core complex, specifically on lysine residues. Okay, now, uh, histone acetyl transferases acetylate lysines uh, on the uh, histone proteins, and this loosens the DNA around the histones. Whereas histone deacetylases remove those acetyl groups, okay, and therefore they are going to um, tighten the DNA back up and reduce transcription of those genes. So, when beta catenin is not present, these TCF LEF transcription factors are actually going to be recruiting these histone deacetylases, uh, which are going to be reducing the transcription of the downstream gene by tightening up how tightly the DNA is wrapped around the histones. And we'll discuss that in more detail in the next video.